and welcome back. In the last lecture, we saw the United States going to war with Great Britain during the War of 1812 and how the war didn't exactly work out for us. Now, I told you at the conclusion of that war, America began to focus inward. This is part of that examination of America focusing inward, and we're going to talk today about the market revolution. So this is part two of chapter nine, Redefining the Nation. What we see is during the first part of the 19th century, the American transformation of our economy really begins. And really what the catalyst for this is, is the new development in things like transportation and communication. Uh, up to this time in America, in the United States, technology really hadn't changed much since our colonial past. And so what we saw was there is a start in the 19th century uh, for better improvement in roads in America. Before, uh, our roads were little more than rut paths in forest. Uh, it wouldn't be uncommon along highways, as they were called at the time, to find uh, tree stumps in the middle of the roads. And oftentimes rain would wash through and wash out complete roads. And so these are just rutted dirt paths in the middle of forest. And I know my picture is blocking this right here, but if you go back to the other slides and blackboard, you can see a picture of uh, a road that was taken during uh, the Civil War, and it pretty much kind of illustrates what we're talking about here. So what happens is, if you have bad transportation, uh, this is going to affect your economy. What are we talking about? Well, basically this. As I said, these roads are little more than rutted paths in the woods. And so if you had to transport goods from one town to another, it could be as expensive as shipping an item from the United States to England. And let me give you some examples. In 1800, so at the beginning of the 19th century, it took 50 days to transport something from Cincinnati, Ohio to New York City. Excuse me. And what we see is it could also, like I told you, be so expensive in transporting something that it really wouldn't be worth transporting. So if you tried to transport something, say, 40 miles, again, it would be expensive as transporting it to England. So again, what we wanted to do to lower transportation costs is we saw that there had to be some kind of improvement in the technology in roads. And where we really get this from is the development of the turnpike. Before we get into this, I also have to say that these developments in these technologies were the steamboat, the canal, railroad, and telegraph. This is really those inventions that are responsible for this market revolution. And with these new inventions, we can now open up new lands to settlement. So all the land to the Mississippi that hasn't been settled yet, that area of the West, these are gonna be now opened up to settlement. And with these improvements, we're gonna be able to lower cost for consumers and it's going to be easier to sell products so again now we can make things cheaper we can sell them cheaper and we can get them out to a world market in a greater time and so what we see is with all these great changes that are about to occur uh, a French writer actually came through uh, de Tocqueville was his name and he actually was kind of recording his uh, observations of America at this time he said viewing how America had really changed because of these inventions he said it looked like America had annihilated space and time so what this means is America is now locked or our farmers are now linked to world markets before with poor transportation they were pretty much con you know, uh, confined to the areas of their farms and the kind of surrounding areas around the farm now with the development of these new technologies and in transportation communication, they can send their goods to world markets. So I was about to touch on this just a while ago and I'll get into it now. The real first development, and your book doesn't talk about this so I would pay attention, really came in the construction of toll roads or turnpikes. We all know what turnpikes are, we still have them today. And what this was is seeing the need for better improvement in roads construction really began by towns states and private companies they would come in provide good roads but again toll roads you have to pay a toll to actually use the road and the toll is used for the upkeep of the road uh, so much so that between 1800 to 1830 there were over 900 companies contracted in new england in the mid-atlantic states to build these roads but the thing about it was the cost in maintaining these roads became more expensive than what a lot of people had imagined and people don't really like 
you know, riding on toll roads. They are very nice roads, but again, you have to pay to ride. So what we saw was surrounding communities began building roads known as shun pikes. So if you didn't want to go on the toll pike and pay your fee, you could actually take these other kind of detour roads, these shun, uh, shun pikes, shun pikes, excuse me, and avoid the toll gates. But I have to say this, even with, you know, the new roads being built, it was still an inefficient mode, an inefficient mode of transportation for horse-drawn wagons. It was going to actually still take a long while to get things transported. Where we really see the main kind of revolution in transportation occurs with water transportation. This is what dramatically uh, lowers cost and increased speed is traveling by water. And where we really kind of see this is on the Erie Canal. Um, the Erie Canal, we still have it today. Uh, it serves mainly as really a tourist attraction. And what we see, it's, it's one of these long canals that was built in 1825. It was actually one of the lar largest canals at the time. It's 363 miles long. This was at a time before this, the longest canal America had was only 28 miles long. So this is a real engineering feat. And what this means is this canal allowed the flow of goods from the Great Lakes area all the way to New York City. So from the Great Lakes you could take the Erie Canal and from the Erie you could transport your goods down the Hudson River to New York and from there you could load your goods onto ships and send them worldwide. So the Erie Canal is really one of these important uh, first steps in this market revolution that we're experiencing in the United States. What we see is it just doesn't accelerate the flow of goods down the canal, it's also attracting an influx of farmers leaving New England and setting up towns along the canal in New York. So we get the birth of places like Buffalo, New York, Rochester, Syracuse. These towns really spring up in uh, a consequence of the canal being built. So again, the canal really gives New York the kind of primacy other, over other ports in the United States and the access to the Old Northwest and the transporting, or transportation of these goods. <coughs> well, you can be expected, you know, uh, you're seeing this and other port towns are looking enviously at what New York's done and they want to copy this. And so what they do is many of these towns begin setting up projects to build these canals and so many borrow so much money that this really uh, is one of the contributing factors into one of the depressions that we get into in the 19, or excuse me, during the 19th century is the depression of 1837. What we see is by that year, so much canals had actually been dug that there's over 3,000 miles of these canals throughout the United States. And with this, um, you're thinking, well, why didn't the federal government get into this? Because this is mainly states doing this themselves. At the time, the federal government is very uh, skittish to get involved with what will be called internal improvements. And we'll see this in the next couple of lectures. Again, this was something that the federal government didn't want to do because, well, because nothing was said about it in the Constitution. Uh, again, many people are still strict constructionists. If it doesn't say anything about internal improvements, they're not going to do it. So it was left up to the states and cities uh, to actually provide the money for these canals. Um, when America does slowly kind of get into, or I should say the federal government gets into actually providing money for this, uh, between 1787 and 1860, there was about $60 billion spent by the federal government to uh, facilitate these internal improvements. To show you how much states were actually, pro uh, actually providing instead of the federal government, the states actually themselves spent 10 times as much money on these internal improvements. So again, these internal improvements are facilitating and helping to uh, support the American economy. Without these, this market revolution wouldn't take place. So with this, these canals are actually creating a network uh, linking the Atlantic states with the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. So again, farmers can transport goods up and down these canals at a faster rate. So you can imagine the advantage of having these canals, say if you were producing, I don't know, or growing pumpkins. And you had to get them down the canal, right? Before on old roads, it would take forever. And we just talked about how long it would take to transport something. Your products would probably ruin before they actually got to market. But now with uh, things like the canals, you can get your uh, goods to market at a quicker rate. 
Here's a map showing the United States of roads and canals being built up to 1840. So again, here you can actually see what we're talking about here. Here is the Erie Canal right here. Linking, there's Rochester, and of course it goes across New York State, and from there it goes down to the Hudson to New York. So again, these areas right here are linked to the outside markets, the worldwide markets. And you can see, again, along here, the red uh, lines represent roads, and little kind of hash blue marks, again, are these canals. So again, you can see how popular these were and how uh, quickly these had actually been produced up within 40 years. <clears throat> like I said, it's really the improved water transportation that really increases the speed and lowers the price of commerce. And the man really responsible for this is Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton was actually born in Pennsylvania. He was an artist, an engineer, but they really wouldn't call inventors at this time inventors like we would know them. They would call them gadgeteers. And what Fulton actually does is he goes to France during the 1790s and he's experimenting with the idea of putting a steam engine uh, on a boat. In 1803, he actually sells one down the Seine River and demonstrates the use of it to actually Napoleon. And what we see is by 1807, Fulton comes back and he actually puts his steamship on the Hudson. Uh, it's known as the Claremont. And from what we see from this new steam uh, technology, it really demonstrates the feasibility of the steamship. What are we talking about? Well, basically, it showed uh, that steamships could, how can I put it, travel upstream. Before the uh, invention of putting a steam engine on a ship, steam, or excuse me, ships relied on basically the currents and wind to take the ship. And again, you couldn't go upstream. You had to follow the current downward. But now with the invention of a steamship, you can go anywhere, upward or downward, uh, up the river. And so again, things can be transported quickly, lowering the cost. By 1811, they put the first real steamship on the Mississippi River. And then by, let's say, 20 years into the future, there's over 200 uh, of these steamships sailing the Mississippi River. So again, this is one of these great kind of uh, steps in accelerating the market revolution within the United States. And this, to a certain extent, kind of eclipses the, the inventions of these canals and the construction of these canals. The one thing that will really kind of also eclipse uh, the construction of the canals will be the railroads themselves, and we'll get into that in just a moment. So again, the steamboats are, again, one of those kind of central pieces in enhancing our market revolution within the United States. Here's an early steamship here. Here's a picture of it. If you don't know what we're talking about and have no idea about what a steamship is, of course, again, my picture right there is blocking it. But again, you can go back into Blackboard and take a look at these. There's a boat with a steam engine put on it. Steam and the harnessing of it was seen as kind of the big technological thing of the day. Kind of like, I guess, what is our big technological thing? The internet. So again, it compares to that. You put a steam engine on a boat and steam or the steam engine is powered by coal or wood heating the water within the engine causing steam and the steams push the pistons and cause uh, the machine to move. So this is what we're talking about here. Robert Fulton's invention, the steam boat. So there is the steam engine. What we're seeing is now technology really in, uh, reshapes industry and agriculture in the United States. What we see is with urban merchants, bankers, master craftsmen, they really take advantage of these economic opportunities to create an expanding market. So what this means now is there's a drive to increase production and lower production cost. Faster, cheaper is the order of the day. So with this, before in America, uh, craftspeople, they were known as artisans, they made goods in their homes. And so they controlled how fast and in the intensity of their work. And if they wanted to knock off for an hour or so and get, say, like a beer and then come back and continue the work, they could do so. They were their own owners, their own managers. But now entrepreneurs are putting these artisans in large workshops. And what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, are early factories. And again, this little... Uh, 
illustration behind my picture is showing what's going on. Uh, as you can see on the top here, here are these artisans and they're working together and they're making chairs, but they're doing it at their own rate and the chairs are probably very elaborately carved and put together. But if you drop down to the picture, and again you can go back into Blackboard and look at this if you haven't already, you see that the tasks now have been broken down. Machinery is actually doing the work that the artisans traditionally used to do. And there is someone in the middle of the room directing these guys, probably the manager or owner of the factory. They're putting together all these chairs. <coughs> so before with craftspeople, where things were passed on by apprentices, learning the trade and passing it on, now what we're seeing is that level of um, how can I say expertise and knowledge is no really it's not really uh, it's not uh, it's not not I, if I can talk it's no longer necessary to learn all these different things again steps have been broken down into the construction of a product what we see is the labor is broken down into less steps and it requires that less skill and training so again what we're seeing is that freedom they once had has now been given up and again they're no longer controlling the speed of their work and they don't have to learn all those elaborate steps in their trades so again we're bringing everybody under one roof and what we're seeing is some industries altogether suspend the traditional crafts uh, the way things were put together before uh, again, we kind of were talking about this, the workers placed under supervision and hand tools are now replaced with machinery. And the real factory, excuse me, the real first factory that we have is Samuel Slater. And Samuel Slater was an English immigrant, but he was also, uh, I guess you could say, kind of the most famous case of industrial espionage. The Industrial Revolution takes place in England. This is why England's able to make goods quickly, cheaply versus other nations. Uh, they harness steam power. And what we see is uh, Samuel Slater sets up a factory and he's interested in this English technology. And what he does is he goes to visit these English factories and he sees something called a spinning jenny. And what a spinning jenny is, is it takes uh, uh, things like cotton and it transforms it into yarn. And from yarn you will be able to produce cloth. What Samuel Slater does is he actually memorizes a blueprint because he can't take these out of England. It's illegal. He comes back and from memory makes a spinning jenny. So he sets up the first factory in the United States at Pawtuck, Rhode Island. Now, if you're thinking about a factory and they produce fully uh, put together products, it's not quite that way yet. What we're seeing is, and with Samuel Slater's factory, uh, they also had something called an outwork system. So what this meant were rural men and women could actually get money from these factories by taking on jobs where they would take the products that hadn't been put together yet. They take them to their homes, they put the products together, and then they give them back to the factory. So if I had a shoe store, or a shoe factory I should say, I would make this leather parts to the shoe and I would give those parts to you and you would take them home and you would stitch them together and then you would bring back the completed shoe to me. So again, it's not a full factory in the ideas that you have today where everything's put together under one roof. We're getting there, but the factory would produce the product itself, the parts, and then this outwork system, you would actually put these parts together within the home. And what we see is by 1807, to the War of 1812, this is really stimulating kind of the first large-scale need for American factories. Because if you remember in our previous talks, we were talking about uh, the British harassing our shipping and then the various ways we were trying to get Britain to stop doing this where we wouldn't trade, and then the war itself disrupts trade. So again, Americans have to make goods themselves. They can't rely on getting things from Europe. And so, uh, again, Samuel Slater sets up this first factory within the United States. <coughs> All right, so how is technology reshaping the industry and agriculture? What we're seeing is by 1820, uh, we're experiencing now what you understand is the full factories where all phases of production are brought together under one roof and these were this was really seen in Lowell Massachusetts where we have the Lowell Mills where we're producing cloth and this is really where kind of the north 
uh, kind of has an upper hand with the South. This is the development of those factories at this time. But we're going to see the importance of the South in just a moment in this factory system. So across New England, these factories are springing up like crazy. And one of the reasons that they are, are a lot of these factories are being pushed, or I should say pushed, they're being put along a fall line. And these early factories are taking advantage of hydroelectric power. This is before steam engines uh, become fully ingrained in these factories. So again, they're putting these factories along uh, rivers and creeks, and they're taking advantage of the water turning the paddle wheels, which in turn generate the power that turns these machines. So again, this is where a lot of these factories are being uh, constructed within the north. And then by 1840, we have steam power. So now these factories aren't confined just to these rivers and creeks. What we're seeing uh, that's also coming along during this time that aids in the quick manufacture and cheap sell of things is something known as the American system of manufacturers. Now, what is this? What this means is things like tools, firearms, shoes, clocks, ironware, farm machinery. They're now using interchangeable parts. Before, let's say if I had a gun and uh, a part broke off, I couldn't take a part from another gun and put it on because chances are it wouldn't fit. There weren't uniformed... Um, uh, how can I put it? Uh, there weren't uniformed ways of making things. There wasn't uniform sizes in which uh, products were made. So one product, uh, say a gear, and it could be a little bit larger than what the other one would be. And it wouldn't work in an, another uh, product just like it. So with this American system of manufacturers, there's a unified size and shape for these uh, products that are being coming out. And so now we can put various parts together quickly and we can roll out products, finished products. And this was the invention actually, believe it or not, of a guy named Eli Whitney. <coughs> of course, this really comes after his first and kind of famous invention, the cotton gin. And we're going to get into this in just a second. What we see is the most dramatic rise in America's economy during the first uh, 30 years is the rise of something known as the Cotton Kingdom. And all the industrialization that was going on in the North wouldn't have been possible without cotton textiles. Because, again, in the North they are producing textiles, cloth. And what gives them the uh, fuel to do this is cotton. Now, cotton itself had been grown in the United States, but it was grown in very small quantities. Why? Well, the thing was, cotton wasn't seen as being very profitable to grow. People had been growing cotton for really thousands upon thousands of years. It was grown in Asia, Africa, you name it, South America. But the thing about it was, it was very time consuming. There wasn't a lot of cotton products out there. Why? Well, it was because of the seed itself. It proved very difficult uh, to try to get out. I think a lot of you may know what cotton balls are having lived in this area. You see it in the fields probably when you're going to school or going home. The seeds themselves are embedded in it and it takes forever to pull it out. Not to mention that trying to pick cotton you're going to kind of pretty much tear up your hands doing it. But once you have the cotton itself, again, you could spend all day just picking out seeds and barely even have a pound of cotton. The guy responsible for this is Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney was from Connecticut. He was a Yale graduate, and after graduating, Eli Whitney was actually faced with the prospect of student loans. I think we all kind of know the, the fear of that and the pressure of it. <coughs> and Eli Whitney actually gets a job going to the South, to Georgia, to tutor uh, children. And he's actually on a plantation, and it's kind of one of those kind of recess hours, and he's sitting under a tree, and he notices that there is a chicken by this kind of uh, clapped board fence and I think everybody knows what we're talking about wooden fences where there's spaces in between the the pieces of wood that make the fence and Eli Whitney observed a chicken pecking at the ground and then he saw a cat's paw reach out between the spaces in the slats of the fence and pulling the cat or excuse me pulling the chicken through the fence and the feathers coming off and he hit upon the idea of using this and trying to remove the seeds from cotton 
And this is where he comes up with the idea of the cotton gin itself. Cotton gin, of course, is short for cotton engine. So with a series of brushes and rollers, he was able to kind of put together one of these things pretty quickly. Uh, anyone could really do this, and much to his uh, kind of chagrin, a lot of people do, and we'll get into that in just a second. So again, you put, as you can see right here, the cotton that's been picked, you put it into the machine, and you turn this handle, and these levers and these gears, of course, brush the cotton out and pull the seeds out, and there are the seeds right there, and what you get is finished cotton, ready to be sent to those northern uh, factories be turned into yarn into cloth um, so with this cotton gin Eli Whitney you have to understand about what patent laws were at this time it was something new and even though he does get a patent on this uh, these rules these patent laws aren't enforced and so anybody could actually put together one of these cotton uh, gins as they became known and they didn't have to pay Eli Whitney any kind of royalties or anything like this. So what little money he did get off the cotton gin, he spent most of the time in court cases. And he will, of course, go on later to invent the American system of manufacturers. But this is his first real true invention that makes his name. What we see is, again, like we experienced before when we were talking about the growth of tobacco, those rich planters who had the money, of course, take the most fertile land, and poor farmers got, of course, poor areas to try to farm. If you remember, we were talking about the uh, Atlantic slave trade, and of course, that was supposed to end in 1808, which it did. But what we see is the unintended consequences of Eli Whitney's cotton gin is it revives slavery. So... Before the invention of the cotton gin, it looked like slavery itself was slowly dying out. But with Eli Whitney's con er, invention of the cotton gin, the need for a slave labor force in the South grows exponentially. And so that was one of the unintended consequences of Eli Whitney's cotton gin, that it spurs on the institution of slavery in the South. Here is a map showing the spread of cotton cultivation for 20 years from 1820 to 1840. As you can see in the upper map, the few kind of areas that are growing cotton. And with Eli Whitney's cotton gin, you can see how these, uh, these plantations have grown tremendously uh, in the south. And if you notice, a lot of these areas, especially in places like Mississippi and Louisiana, if my picture isn't blocking it, they're mainly concentrated along the river right there. Reason being, of course, along the Mississippi, transportation. A lot of these places will be... Uh, in areas where you can kind of or again transport either through rail or canal or steamship to get your markets to prod or your goods to market excuse me so again as i was telling you uh eli whitney's invention greatly enhances the institution of slavery uh what we saw was one million slaves are shifted from older slave states to the deeper south for the 60-year period so 1800 1860 Slavery itself was slowly dying out in the North, and what many people in the North were doing were sending their slaves to be sold in the South. So again, a lot of these people are being transported there and sold at auction. And slave trading itself became a well-organized business with firms throughout the South. It was a money-making business, and these again, these firms sprout out to uh, meet that labor demand. And again, a lot of these slaves are being transported from the North into the South. So by 1793, when Whitney actually comes up with his invention, uh, there's about, the U.S. is producing about 5 million pounds of cotton. By 1820, they are now producing 170 million pounds. Before, with Eli Whitney's uh, invention, I told you, if you were trying to pull the seeds out of cotton, you would probably get about a pound. With Eli Whitney's invention, you had about 50 pounds of processed cotton. So again, this was a great, a great leap forward. And again, this is the material that's using to uh, fuel the growth of factories in the North itself. One invention that's the, probably the most important out of all is the railroads. They were responsible for opening the, the vast new areas of the interior of the United States for settlement. And the construction of the railroads themselves spurs on other areas of the economy, like coal and iron manufacturing for the trains and the rails. 
And what we see is our first kind of working commercial railroad begins in 1828, and it's the Baltimore on Ohio. And this is what the early kind of train looked like here. Again, just basically a steam engine up on a block with some wheels and a throttle to control it. And you're thinking, well, you know, how fast do these trains really go? About 30 to 35 miles an hour. And you're thinking, well, that's not very fast. Keep in mind that, say, in a carriage being pulled by horses, the most you could go is about 10 miles an hour, and you really couldn't maintain that same level of speed. Horses are living animals, and of course they're going to get tired, so they can only do this for a short period of time. But with these railroads, or railroad trains, and the cars themselves, they're able to go up to 35 miles an hour and maintain that speed. So by the time we get to the eve of the Civil War, our railroad network has grown to be over 30,000 miles of railroad track that's been laid in our country. And that is, uh, the total is greater than the rest of the world combined itself. And with this new invention comes another invention that revolutionizes communication in the United States. And it's the great, great granddaddy to the cell phone that you have now. And that is the telegraph. The telegraph is invented in 1830 by Samuel Morse. Samuel Morse himself was a painter and later a gadgeteer. And what we see is he sees the need to transport information quickly uh, because before the invention of the telegraph how you got word was through the mail and of course the mail itself due to poor roads and transportation conditions could take weeks to get to you and so Morris saw the need to uh, again facilitate faster communication and he comes up with this telegraph and again you're sending uh, how can I put it uh, beeps and dots by electric current along uh, lines that have been strung out from city to city and operators on the other end can hear these beeps and these dots and of course this represents different letters in the alphabet the Morse code and you can transport uh, transport communications quickly almost instantaneously so within 16 years there's about 50,000 miles of, of these uh, telegraph wires that have been strung and again they're along the railroad lines themselves so in the beginning the telegraph was mainly used for businesses mainly like newspapers stocks and it's only later that we actually use it for individual communications with telegrams themselves so again we're speeding the flow of information and what it's also doing with the economy is there's bringing a uniform of prices to the goods that we're selling throughout America. The irony is Samuel Morris, an American who invents this, he's honored throughout Europe and he's given medals and prizes and he's kind of lauded as the man of the hour, but in the United States we didn't really do anything for him because of this invention. The gratitude of America, I guess. All right, ladies and gentlemen, or I should say ladies, I don't know why I keep saying gentlemen, the only gentleman left. Uh, again, uh, this is the end of part two. I'll put up part three as soon as I can. Have a good day.